Thank you all so much for joining. Uh, my name is Grace Iberly and I am a registered dietitian. I work for Arch Amenity Group. Um, for those of you who have been with Life Start previously, we have rebranded to Arch Amenity Group. So um, as we are still currently Life Start On Demand, but in the process of rebranding everything. Um, so if you see those names, they are um, interchangeable at this point. Um, so very excited to be here today and talk to everybody about good food for good mood. Um, this is a topic that I find to be really important, um, especially considering that May is Mental Health Awareness Month. Um, I do want to reiterate, and you'll hear me say this um, throughout the presentation, as we're talking about food for a good mood, it's not something that you eat this, you feel happy. Our mood is much more complex like that than that. There's a lot of different puzzle pieces that fit in. And so with... Um, Food is just one component of it. So we will dive in and go ahead, get started. Feel free, pop any questions that you have in the chat. Um, I will try and answer them as we're going through, um, but I will definitely save some time at the end to answer as well. Wonderful. What we will be talking about today, our objectives are first just defining mood and hormones um, directly related to mood. And then, um, so we'll kind of be going in a little bit more of talking, as I said, a little bit about our overall um, mood. We'll go through and connect various reasons of why we eat the foods that we do. So why do we make the different food choices that we do? And that um, can definitely link to our moods as well. We'll go ahead and um, explain a little bit of the science behind what we eat and cognitive health as well as cognitive function. So how our brains operate. And then we can go ahead and um, I want you guys to leave with some takeaways of some particular um, lifestyle factors that you can control that can help with influencing your mood. So getting started, as we are looking at our mood, thinking about, um, as I mentioned, mood is not permanent. It's not like you wake up in one mood and you feel that for the entire day. Heck, your mood even changes from minute to minute, even more frequently, or it can change more frequently than that even. All right, I think I paused for a little. So hopefully you guys are still there. Um, so what I wanna go through is talk through our happy hormones. So the reason I wanna start with this is we will talk about as the different foods that we choose, the different choices that we make or lifestyle modifications, how all of those can impact these happy hormones. And our happy hormones are gonna help us with um, improving our moods. So getting started with dopamine. Uh, dopamine is considered more of our feel-good hormone. Um, it's part of our brain reward system. So it gives us pleasurable sensations. It's typically associated with learning new things, memory, as well as motor, uh, motor system function. So there's more to it, but just a kind of basic overview. Serotonin, um, serotonin functions in pretty much every element of our bodies, but um, we'll emphasize today talking about how serotonin impacts our mood, sleep, appetite, digestion, learning ability, as well as memory. And 90% of it is actually created in our gut. So that's where the foods that we choose that can impact our gut health can have a big influence then on our serotonin production. So we will get to that. Our oxytocin, this is considered more of that love hormone and it's essential for childbirth, breastfeeding and a strong parent-child bonding. Um, this is um, gonna be important and we'll talk about this as we're talking about how we eat meals, who we share meals with, but it's really um, can kind of be more considered our relationship hormone. So it's promoting trust, empathy, and well as that bonding in relationships. And then we have our endorphins. So endorphins are a natural pain reliever. They're produced in response to stress or discomfort. So you um, may be more familiar with endorphins um, when it's talked about with exercise. Um, exercise is gonna um, increase our stress and endorphins are released in order to respond to that. So endorphins are increased um, with activities such as eating, exercise, as well as sex. So as I mentioned, this is just a brief overview of some of our happy hormones. As we're diving through the presentation, we will definitely dive in to why, um, to how these can all play a role. Okay, so oh, let's hide that real quick. <laughs> so go ahead in your chat. So chat here. Let's answer that question. Why do we eat what we eat? So this can be, there's no wrong answers. 
just thinking of what, you know, why do we make the food decisions that we do? Why do we choose the meals that we eat? Why do we just why you're hungry, energy, cravings, nutrition, taste, stress, pro-social behavior, certainly stress again, definitely all really great answers. Emotions for sure. Amount of time, comfort, availability. Yeah. Amount of time, convenience, certainly fun. Yeah. We definitely eat for fun, eat for, uh, to feel our souls a bit. Cost and expense could do with it. Definitely figuring out what's affordable and what works within our budgets. Awesome. Well, I think you guys hit the nail on the head with a lot of these. Um, uh, just to list some, this is not everything, all the reasons we eat, but some of them are certainly energy and fuel. You know, our bodies run on food. Um, we need to eat that in order to function and do things. Um, health and longevity. So thinking a little more health down the line, uh, maybe prevention, um, helping you feel better. Our, our pleasure. So foods that we enjoy, taste definitely is going to have an impact. Convenience. Um, I know when you get busy and it's like, okay, I just need to eat something to eat something. What can I grab on the go? Um, if you're out running errands, what's out in, um, what is out in the close by where you're running errands, where you can pick something up quickly. Um, social engagement. I think someone had said that definitely a big thing. If you think of all holidays and social gatherings are tend to be centered, centered around food. So if you think, you know, you go on a first date, you go out to dinner, you grab coffee. Um, Thanksgiving is definitely centered around a meal. Um, birthdays, you have birthday cake. There's a lot of food that can be involved in all of our celebrations and social obligations. And then stress and emotions are definitely going to play an impact. Um, so when we think about how we're feeling, is that affecting our food choices or also our food choices affecting how we feel? So a lot of back and forth, a little bit of that chicken and, or the egg, which came first. So I want to go through um, a particular study um, through the University of Delaware. Essentially, what they wanted to do is test to see how our emotions impacted our food choices. So what they did is they did four different studies. Um, one of them, they worked with a, about over 200 individuals of a local PTA and actually had kind of a positive focus group. And then as well as just more like a negative or, uh, sorry, not negative. This one was more of a neutral group. So positive, they kind of brought in and um, got everyone in a good mood and then saw how it affected their choices. So what they found out is that um, when people were in a positive mood, it favored more healthful foods um, and kind of considering a little more of our future well-being. They then also wanted to test, okay, the opposite, you're feeling more negative, how is that going to impact our food choices? So they looked at a study um, with over 300 individuals from a um, university in the Midwest and essentially kind of just wanted to continue their hypothesis of how mood affects your food choices. Um, so those who are more positive, again, like the more nutritious options and like the idea of staying healthy in their old age. Um, so kind of reiterating that thought that positive we're thinking more abstractly, we're thinking more into the future as well. Um, so then they wanted to go ahead and eliminate more of that goal achievement as a, a potential like alternative explanation into why people are making those food choices. And so looking if um, they had one control group reading more positive articles, so um, explaining people who met their life goals and had these great life goals, and then the other group was reading more negative articles, so someone who had maybe more a sad life and didn't quite achieve their goals. So they were wondering if the findings were due to manipula manipulation of having more goal achievement or manipulation having led to different moods. And so it found that it was a little more linked to those moods. Um, so just kind of summarizing these different studies, they showed that the negative mood really um, had people focus more on that immediate taste and more sensory experience. So when we're not feeling good, we might be looking at food, what's close right by, what's that immediate reward that I'm gonna get. And so really trying to focus on those elements we had talked, we had um, brought up of why we, what we do of just what's close by, what tastes good, um, and how is that going to impact to make us feel better in the here and now? Whereas our positive mood was really more preferring more healthful foods, looking more to the future, including more health benefits. So a way to kind of um, reiterate this is thinking if you're in a negative mood, you're really looking at 
an end of your and you're in a forest you're really looking at that individual tree so what's right here what's here now whereas if you're in a positive mood you're really looking at the bigger forest the bigger picture kind of seeing more abstractly maybe not what's exactly in front of you but what's entirely possible around you so one of the kind of outcomes is figuring out okay so Yes, we can utilize food to impact our food choices. So maybe looking at some other ways that we can um, improve our mood. So mood repair motivation and trying to find more innocuous ways to enhance our mood that aren't related to food. So that could be something like talking to friends, going and putting on some music, going for a walk, journaling, all of these things that can have that um, positive impact and benefit on our mood that isn't going to then impact our food choices. So definitely just some interesting food for thought um, of how our mood is definitely gonna impact the foods that we eat. Now, as I mentioned, it really is not as simple as eat this and then feel happy. So our moods aren't that simplistic. They're much more complex. There's a lot that goes into influencing how we feel and nutrition is just that is one component of it. So there are many aspects of life, including keeping active, being a non-smoker, maintaining a balanced diet are important factors that are gonna help us both physically and mentally stay healealthy. So diving in, I um, wanna talk a little bit about anxiety, stress, and depression. So looking more into that kind of cognitive function. So there's a newer um, area within nutrition called nutritional psychiatry. And this is examining and establishing a link between overall diet quality as well as depression and anxiety. Um, so this is definitely really kind of thinking now just biologically how we operate and how we function. So our brain needs a constant supply of energy. It actually may, takes about 20% of what our total daily calorie needs are go to fuel our brain. So kind of thinking then, okay, if our brain is, or the foods that we're eating is that they're going towards, brain, towards our brain, how is that impacting? So since food is composed of nutrients, it can impact our brain chemistry, which then could potentially impact our mood. So going in to another research, um, another study, the SMILES trial. Now SMILES stands for Supporting the Modification of Lifestyle and Lowered Emotional States. So essentially what they did with this study um, is they took, it was a 12 week dietary intervention in the treatment of major depressive disorder. They took two groups, one group um, met, so they were all given similar guidance of what to follow on the meals. One of the groups met with a befriending group. What that means is they um, are essentially meeting with, um, with a support system that's completely neutral. So they just have conversations. It's not a positive impact, it's not a negative impact, and there's no education. It's just kind of, again, neutral. And then the diet group, where they're actually meeting with a dietitian and giving more hands-on um, suggestions and improvements for how they can um, modify their diet. So the diet group considered that modified Mediterranean diet, um, which you can see here on the right, and we will dive into more about the uh, Mediterranean diet, but really the emphasis is more focusing on um, whole grains, plant foods, fatty fish, um, lower servings of red meat, um, focusing on more lean proteins. And so what their outcomes showed that the group that met with the dietitian and followed that modified Mediterranean diet had a greater reduction in depressive symptoms over a three month period. So again, really interesting. This is um, a newer element that we're learning more about um, of how our diet can impact that anxiety, stress and depression, but showing that making those more healthful choices and following this diet can be over a three month period can help um, with depressive symptoms. So definitely really fascinating to see again, kind of that initial phases of, okay, we're learning a little bit and there's a lot more that we can continue to learn. So moving on, we're talking, um, going into inflammation. So inflammation is, oh, we've got someone joining. Okay. Um, inflammation is an essential physiological process. So inflammation is our body's response to um, healing inner injury, infection, toxin, or, or trauma. Um, typically it's pretty short lived. However, um, chronically inflammation can negatively both impact our brain, our nervous system, and a lot of our chronic diseases can stem from chronic inflammation. So inflammation is something that is always going to happen in our body, but focusing on how much and how long and why, where it's coming from is going to have a big impact on, um, could have a big impact on, um, 
potential and potentially improving our moods. So let's see, it looks like we have a question. Is thinking of inflammation as swelling too simple? No, um, the, I wouldn't say that's too simple. So essentially a, a way that you can think about it, you know, like if you get a little cut on your hand and then it turns um, a little bit red, it scabs over, it's your body's healing process. So thinking of that kind of more externally, but that can be happening internally as well. So what's happening in our cells and any potential short-term damage or long-term damage. So this is where when we have that elevated inflammation that's chronically happening, um, you kind of can kind of think of it as the swelling maintains and continues and does, doesn't heal. So if you have a cut on your hand and it just stays a cut, it never is healed and new skin grows over. If that kind of helps to, um, to visualize it. So going in, to inflammation and how that is linked to depression. So it's a bi-directional relationship. So essentially inflammation can then fuel those flames of depression. And then depre depression can also prime our inflammatory cytokine response to stressors and different pathogens. So it's a little bit of that chicken and egg, which came first. Did inflammation cause depression? Did depression continue or cause inflammation. So there's definitely uh, that bi-directional relationship. So we wanna try and manage it from both managing depression as well as managing that inflammation. So when we think about, there we go. Okay, our diets roll on inflammation. So food can certainly fuel or cool our inflammatory processes. I would say in the last three to five years, there's been a lot more discussion on anti-inflammatory diets and anti-inflammatory foods. Um, and so you may have heard of some of these before, um, but essentially foods that are gonna cause excess inflammation is gonna be things like just first consuming excess calories, that's one. You know, you're putting your body, over consuming just causes your body to overwork in a sense, which can cause more inflammation. Um, different refined sugars and processed, highly processed foods can also um, cause more inflammation, not consuming enough omega-3 fatty acids, and we'll dive into what those are. And then if you have an intolerance to something, so if you're intolerant to gluten or casein, but you continue to eat them, it's essentially your body keeps fighting that, causing more of that inflammation. And then... Um, Outside of food, other kind of pro-inflammatory factors are in, going to include things like stress, um, which unfortunately, given the, the state of the world right now and the pandemic, there we definitely have elevated stress in our lives, um, and stress is um, similar to that inflammation. It's a natural thing that's happening in our body and is typically short-lived, but chronic stress can certainly have a negative impact. Um, Over-consuming alcohol, not getting enough sleep. Um, not moving enough, so sitting. Um, you may have heard the phrase that sitting is the new smoking. All of these are elements that can lead to more inflammation um, that's not just diet related. So again, nutrition is just one piece of the puzzle. There are other pieces of the puzzle that can help us to um, help us to feel better and help us to improve our mood. So we started talking a little bit about our gut when we talked about serotonin, um, but our gut is going to to me, our gut health is something that in 10, 20 years, we're going to know so much more. So to me, it is one of the most fascinating topics because there's, we're just on the cusp of learning something big. Um, so our gut health is part of our enteric nervous system, which is the main division of our auto, our auto autonomic nervous system. It's made up of over 30 different types of neurotransmitters and over a hundred million neurons. So thinking of just what's happening in our gut. Um, essentially, it's going to communicate with our big brain through all those neurotransmitters. So you may have heard before the gut brain access and just how those communicate with each other. Um, that essentially, you know, if you hear that term of like, oh, you know, I feel it in my gut or go with your gut, there is a little bit, there is some validity behind that um, with what biologically is occurring in our bodies. So definitely super fascinating of, as I mentioned, we know we know just a little bit about, we know that there is some kind of correlation, but um, still a lot that we are learning. So going back to our inflammation, if we have an imbalance of unhealthy bacteria, so 
the food is certainly going to impact the food that we eat is certainly going to impact our gut bacteria, but we have an imbalance of that unhealthy bacteria that can change our neurotransmitter function. So making it, so they're not functioning the way that they're meant to. And again, those neurotransmitters are how we're going to communicate with our brain and sense things. Um, so if our neurotransmitters aren't functioning properly, it can lead to our immune system overreacting. And that overreaction can lead to more inflammation in the gastrointestinal tract. And that's where we've already talked about how infl inflammation can negatively impact um, our health as well as our mood and could be linked to depression. So we definitely want to take think about, okay, what are we eating and how is that affecting our gut? Oh, and the inflammation can lead to that disease in the body as well as potentially in the brain. So this is something too, again, very um, early on in the cusp of uh, research, but potentially the link between like gut health and Alzheimer's, um, there could be some kind of correlation happening there. So I'm not an expert in that, so I don't want to speak to that, but definitely something that um, I could help with doing a little digging to find out more. Okay. So we talked about serotonin being one of those, one of our happy hormones, um, serotonin, it impacts every part of our body. It's from our emotions to our motor skills. It helps with sleeping, eating digestion. So it's a very, very important hormone and it's a natural mood stabilizer. So, um, again, thinking, okay, if 90% of serotonin is actually produced in our gut, if we're, if our gut is unhealthy and it's not making that much production, then maybe we're not getting as much serotonin as what our body needs. And that's where our mood is kind of either all over the place or more depressive. So it's going to help with serotonin will help with regulating our anxiety, happiness, and mood. When our levels are normal, we tend to be happier, calmer, more focused, less anxious, more emotionally stable. Um, all the things that we would, we like, um, with our serotonin is lower can actually lead to more levels of depression. Now there are medications that you can take to help improve your serotonin. Um, however, a lot of those show that there does tend to be a decrease in arousal as well. So there is always a, or there can always be a place for medication. Um, but I still always like to practice of how can we impact, um, what's happening in our bodies through what we're eating, how we're moving, how we're sleeping, how we're managing our stress. So definitely something to take into consideration when um, figuring out just overall how we're feeling. That medication, there's a place for it. Um, definitely wanna take advice of your doctor, but still thinking of what are these natural ways I can help with improving, um, improving my health. Okay, let's see, we got a chat. Is serotonin production levels and happiness a linear relationship? Ooh, that's a really great question. Um, I don't have an exact answer for you on that. I would speculate it's not a linear relationship um, just because there are, again, different factors and things that are going to impact your happiness and mood that is out of the control of serotonin, if that kind of makes sense. Um, but serotonin can definitely help with... Um, just naturally stabilizing your mood. Um, so I would say no, but that's just my speculation of it. Um, we could do a little more digging and see if there is any more, any more research that could show that. Awesome. Great question though. So going in to foods for your gut, and again, that can, if our gut is healthy, then that can help with decreasing inflammation that can help with, um, meeting and maintaining our serotonin production levels. Um, it also can just help you feel better if your gut's feeling good. Um, you know, if things are moving along fine. They're not clogged up or moving too fast. Um, so focusing on foods for our gut. This, like I said, similar to kind of the anti-inflammatory and um, diet and those foods, I would say foods for our gut have definitely been a big topic of discussion in recent years. So getting started thinking about our probiotics. Probiotics are the food. So our gut is made up of, bacter of bacteria um, and we want to try and focus on some more of the good bacteria. So probiotics are actual live bacteria that we consume. Um, they're going to be found in fermented foods. So I've listed some here, kefir, buttermilk, yogurt, kimchi, sauerkraut, tempeh. Tempeh is a fermented soy product. Um, so it kind of looks like it's kind of like a nuttier, denser tofu. Um, if you haven't cooked with it before or tried it. So these are all foods that are, have those live active cultures in it. Now I do want to just, um, 
And do you want to say something like if you buy a canned sauerkraut, that's going to be pasteurized and actually won't have that bacteria versus if you buy a refrigerated sauerkraut, that's going to, because it's live and naturally fermented, that is going to have some of that um, good bacteria in it. Now, this is one thing if we think of, okay, probiotics, think of it when you're gardening and you put the seeds down. Great. That's what the probiotics are. But what we want is some prebiotics then. So the prebiotics are going to be essentially the food that that probiotics feed on. So if we just put our seeds out in the garden, we don't do anything, they might not thrive. But if we put the seeds in the garden and then we water it and we give it sunlight and we add fertilizer, we're going to help to see those seeds grow and flourish. And that's what the prebiotics essentially are. So from a um, chemical standpoint, our prebiotics um, contain inulin, polydextrose, fructooligosaccharides, and galactooligosaccharides. Um, but putting it in, in layman's terms of how can we find those in our foods, things like uh, bananas, honey, leeks, onions, and garlics are full of prebiotics, fortified foods and beverages. Um, so some of the foods will have prebiotics added. Um, other naturally occurring things like Jerusalem artichoke, raw chicory root, raw leeks, dandelions, and then certain legumes will have those prebiotics as well. So this is where it's important to have, to make sure that we're not just planting the seed, we're also fertilizing it and watering it and giving it what it needs to be, to thrive and be successful. Um, other elements looking for more of the anti-inflammatory and fiber rich foods. So again, if we're having more inflammation in our gut, that's gonna lead, could potentially be an uninhabitable plate uninhabitable place, that's a difficult word to say, <laughs> for our bacteria. Um, so we all know that fruits and veggies can be really important for us. And so really trying to emphasize getting our four to five servings of veggies a day, making sure we're getting fruit each day. Healthy fats are gonna be really important too. So um, and healthy fats are gonna be more anti-inflammatory. Um, so things like extra virgin olive oil, nuts and seeds, and then getting our omega-3 fatty acids. So omega-3 fatty acids are often gonna come from our seafood. Um, wild caught fish tends to be higher um, than farm raised, but it's still something I always say, you know, having, if you can only find the farm raised salmon at your grocery store, it's still a good healthy option. Um, Grass-fed beef will also have higher omega-3 fatty acids as well. So um, incorporating more of our healthy fats can certainly help with the anti-inflammatory rich food or anti-inflammatory foods. Our fruits and veggies and legumes and whole grains are going to be really helpful for a fiber-rich diet. What about grapeseed oil? That's a good question. Let's look that up. Um, typically grapeseed oil is one of those ones that I would say, um, it has some good vitamin E levels and antioxidant properties. It's more kind of like the highly refined vegetable oils are going to have more omega sixes. Let me look into that and I can get back to you, Debbie, on that. Um, if you combine probiotics and prebiotics, will they work better in comparison to eating them separate? That's a really great question. Um, with that, I would say typically um, the research is still out a little bit, um, similar with like probiotic supplements of, if you look at probiotic supplements, when you walk down the aisle, you know, you'll see some that say, this has 1 billion, this has 6 billion, this has 1 million bacteria. Um, so there's still a lot of what the benefit is or which ones will give us the best benefit and which type of bacteria, but it's also going to impact or be dependent on what's what else is happening too. So I would say more just consuming them regularly is going to give you the best bang for your buck. Um, probiotics, consuming them sometimes with fat can actually help them to get to your gut. So when we talk about our gut, we're talking a little bit more about, let me go back to the this picture. Okay. So when we're talking about our gut, we're talking a little bit more about our large intestine or our colon. So that's kind of this big outer area. So when we eat food, we chew it. That's going to start mechanical breakdown. Our saliva actually has some enzymes that are going to start the breakdown. We swallow it down and it goes into our stomach. Our stomach is where we will add secrete um, some acids. That's going to, and it actually kind of shakes a little bit. And that's going to be a little mechanical and chemical breakdown as well. Then it gets released into our small intestine. And that's this kind of big area here that has a lot more um, 
surface areas, so to speak. So a lot of our nutrients do get absorbed out of our small intestine. And then, wait, we have someone else hopping in. And then we, our food travels into our large intestine. So part of when we're thinking of consuming those probiotics, it's okay, what is even making it into all the way to our colon? So that's where sometimes consuming it with more of a fat can actually be helpful. And then making sure we're continually incorporating more of those prebiotics. So it does have what it needs to kind of thrive and flourish. Um, but this is where, again, at that initial stages of kind of learning, you know, what's best practices or what should everyone be doing? I think just making sure you are getting probiotics naturally occurring, um, from foods. I always say food first, um, supplements have a way can be beneficial, but if you think about even the word itself, supplement should be supplementing your diet. Um, so trying to focus on food first and then supplement second. Um, so having some kind of probiotics with a meal, um, can, and with some fats can help to get it to your actual colon. And then finally, continuing on our anti-inflammatory and fiber-rich foods, our whole grains and legumes. So those fiber is going to help support a good gut. It's going to help. It kind of moves things along. It connects as a scrubbing brush in our intestine. Um, it can also help with regulating our cholesterol levels too. So definitely trying to incorporate that. So this little graphic always makes me laugh at the bottom. Um, someone there all by himself and then eating a more potentially inflammatory food. And then over here, looking at kind of all the more whole grains and the nuts or the bacteria is thriving and flourishing. Okay, so supplementation, as I mentioned, um, some study or supplementation, uh, my views are really just to think of it as supplementing, um, can not being your main source of those nutrients. And so this is something definitely if you get blood work done and talk with your doctor and they recommend supplementation, we do want to, um, based off of like blood work, it can be helpful, but if you're low in vitamin D, instead of just taking a vitamin D supplement, let's try focusing on some more vitamin D rich foods as well. I have a question. Do you have suggestions for good gluten-free grains? Ooh, yes. Um, so gluten-free grains, a lot of our whole grains are going to have, um, so like brown rice, quinoa, um, buckwheat. Buckwheat is a little tricky one because it has the word wheat in it, but it actually is gluten-free. Um, brown rice. I'm trying to think of farro. Let me do a little, because grain is gonna, or gluten is gonna be found in wheat, rye, and barley. So a lot of our ancient grains will, be gluten-free. If you go to the grocery store in the section where you can buy quinoa, there's typically a lot of different grains. Um, so if you look on the back, they should have the gluten-free label because um, they do have to list on there if there is gluten in them. So I would say like brown rice is a great one, quinoa, buckwheat, farro, amaranth. Um, there are a lot of like chickpea or rice-based pastas now that are gluten-free that you could try. Um, kind of just depends on where you've shot, but Carolyn, I'll have my email at the end. If you want to shoot me an email, um, I can try and send you some information there. So going in to our, to, um, possible supplementation and how it can impact our mood. Um, so getting started looking at zinc, Zinc is one that we've probably also heard a lot about during the pandemic because it is helpful for our immune system, but zinc is known for helping with fighting our germs, making protein to repair our body, which can help with supporting that immune system. Deficiency can is actually linked to depression and anxiety. So incorporating zinc with an antidepressant can also help to improve the efficacy of that antidepressant. So again, supplementation sources or reasoning, and then some also food sources as well. So zinc is found in red meat, poultry, fortified breakfast cereals, beans, nuts, and whole grains. Then we've got our magnesium. Magnesium is really important for mood regulation and then cell transport and energy production. Magnesium can be found in our legumes, beans, peas, lentils, nuts, pumpkin seeds, or pepitas are a big one, whole grains, spinach, Swiss chard, uh, Swiss chard excuse me, avocado, and okra. Uh, vitamin D, this is definitely a really big one um, that 
a lot of us, I'm here based out of Chicago and it is actually raining today. So where we're not getting, it's that sunshine vitamins. So we're not getting our sun exposure. We could have lower levels of vitamin D, um, but vitamin D is linked to strong bones and teeth. It has um, good benefits for our immune system and then muscle and nervous system as well. So in food, we can get vitamin D from things like fatty fish. That's going to be our salmon, uh, rainbow trout, uh, herring, mackerel, and tuna count um, as our fatty fish as well. Um, mushrooms, egg yolk. So eating the whole egg will give you a little more vitamin D. Liver, um, and then certain fortified foods like milks and orange juice that have vitamin D added to it. And then our omega-3 fatty acids, these are the ones that are essential for brain health, um, our eyes, heart health, and can actually help with protecting our body against different germs and bacteria and supporting our immune function. So most of these, our best sources of omega-3 fatty acids are gonna be coming from seafood. Um, so our fish and seafood are actually gonna absorb more of those omega-3, um, whereas, so our EPA and our DHA sources, Whereas our alpha linoleic sources are our plant-based sources. Those are things like our plant oils, nuts and seeds, flaxseed oil, walnuts, chia seeds, certain fortified foods, eggs, milk, and soy beverages. Um, we can get some omega-3s from there, but it's not as bioavailable and our body isn't going to utilize it in the same way. So I do highly recommend and encourage everyone to incorporate um, fish uh, two to three times a week um, to try and meet those needs. And that's something Again, being in Chicago, fish isn't as readily available versus if we we're in a, on a coastal place, but potentially a supplementation could be helpful. And then finally, we have our folate and folic acid. Um, this is the uh, nutrient that is often discussed when women are pregnant or trying to become pregnant um, because it can lead to um, neural um, def defects in the fetus and the baby. So thinking it does have that impact on our brain function. So could impact our brain function out outside of pregnancy. Um, so folate may boost our symptom relief when combined with an antidepressant. So looking at things like leafy green veggies, citrus fruits, beans, fortified breads, and cereals. So one of the things I do want to point out, because I don't expect anyone to like memorize these or see, um, I need to eat this to get more of that. If we look at most of what these food sources are, they're coming from whole foods. And so really trying to emphasize and reiterate that when we're building our meals of how can we get that variety and emphasize those different um, food sources. So we'll wrap up with some of those. Again, we've talked a lot about different foods to choose, um, but just kind of Put a, tie it together in a pretty package with a nice bow. We'll talk about some foods to choose and foods to lose. So getting started, the Mediterranean diet. Um, this is a really big one in the last 20 years that has gained a lot of traction. Um, it is, again, really emphasizes a lot more whole grain or whole foods. So if you look at the bottom of this pyramid, most of your foods are going to be made up of plant-based foods or fruit, veggies, whole grains, olive oil, beans, nuts, legumes seeds, herbs, and spices. So really trying to get a lot of those colorful fruits and veggies in, then followed by fish and seafood. So getting some good uh, sources of protein, good sources of omega-3s and heart healthy fats. And then smaller amounts of our um, poultry eggs, cheese, and yogurt, and then smaller amounts as well of our red meats and sweets. Now they do, um, Red wine in moderation is often included in the Mediterranean diet as well as drinking water. So there is more research that's needed to link directly the Mediterranean diet directly to impacting depression, but there is research to show that following a Mediterranean diet can help with lowering your blood pressure, it can help improve cognitive function, and then lower incidence of diabetes and cardiovascular disease. The other element that I really love about the Mediterranean diet is really focusing on this bottom of the pyramid as well as so being physically active and enjoying meals together and with one another. So that's a huge element. So non-food related elements. So sharing meals with family and friends, we're going to go back to those happy hormones. So thinking of the um, oxytocin and those elements and how that can impact how we're feeling is by spending time and sharing meals with other. So enjoying a glass of red wine. So thinking of that really much in that moderation of um, enjoying what we're consuming, not um, eating it really quickly or not savoring it. And then being physically active. So living a more sedentary life can increase our risk for a lot of different um, 
health implications. And so incorporating that into our lifestyle factors, whether that's going for a walk, getting up and dancing, um, playing a sport, just getting up and moving a little bit more can have a really big impact on our overall health and a huge impact on our mental health as well. So going into our foods to lose, we've talked about our inflammatory promoting foods. Um, so those highly processed food, refined carbs and processed grains, foods that are really high in sugar, um, trans fats and hydrogenated fats, and then our refined vegetable oils. Those are higher in omega-6 fatty acids, which can lead to more of that chronic inflammation. Caffeinated drinks, this is one, I'm not saying you need to skip your coffee. Um, uh, but having it in moderation, being mindful of it. So this also kind of thinking again into not just food related, but if you're drinking caffeine late at after one o'clock, after 2 p.m. and you are complaining of having poor sleep habits or you're not able to sleep, it might be linked to that caffeine consumption. So being mindful there. And then alcohol, not, um, not over consuming and being mindful as well, making sure we're still drinking lots of water. And then foods to lose is overly restrictive diets. And um, this is where, again, leading into more of not necessarily just the foods that we're eating, but if we are very strict with ourselves, that can potentially promote more obsessive thoughts. It could lead to more social isolation. So if you're following a really strict diet and then you're not able to go out to eat with family and friends, you're um, because your diet doesn't allow it, or you can't celebrate a meal or a birthday or a holiday or a birthday with family because your diet doesn't allow it. So this can lead to increasing more of our stress and those cortisol, which is our stress hormone, which can also have negative impacts on your health. So uh, my food philosophy is really that food should not be something that we're ever feeling guilty or shamed around. Um, that shame and guilt and frustration can increase our stress. And again, that can then negatively impact our health. So I know I'm saying to like, these are our foods to lose. If you have them for once in a while, that's fine. Think more of like, what are we doing most of the time? Am I able to kind of really, really emphasize more of these colorful fruits and veggies, whole grains, fatty fish, um, lean proteins. And then finally, we'll wrap it up with some other um, lifestyle factors that can help with improving a good mood. I've touched on these throughout, but just to kind of drive home with them, exercise, um, Exercise is a little counterintuitive in the sense that it actually increases our stress, but then um, because we're moving, putting stress on the body, but it teaches our man our body how to manage that stress and it releases endorphins. Um, if anyone here is a Legally Blonde fan, there is a classic line from that movie um, where um, Brooke, who's the defendant, um, who's on trial for shooting her husband, talks about, she's like, endorphins make you happy, or Reese. Reese Witherspoon is defending her and she's like, endorphins make you happy. Happy people just don't shoot their husbands. And so that is a great way to remember how exercise is going to help to release our endorphins and help make us happy and help to stabilize our mood. All right. And then we have our stress management. As I mentioned, we are living in a really stressful time um, through the pandemic, through hybrid work environments, hybrid school environments. Um, other world factors, there's a lot going on. So finding ways that can manage your stress and stress management, we could spend a whole hour talking about that, but find what works for you. You know, maybe it isn't a bubble back and reading a book. Maybe it's journaling. Maybe it's going outside and going for a walk. Maybe it's talking to somebody, talking to a therapist, talking to a friend, talking to a family member. There's a lot of ways that we can help manage our stress. So kind of find, maybe it's being creative, using your hands, coloring, painting, molding, uh, clay to make pottery. There's a lot of things that can help. Um, gardening, that's a really big one actually as well. And then relationships, focusing on those relationships again can lead to increasing some of those happy hormones. So sharing a meal, there's so much research out there um, about having family meals. Um, again, it doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be seven days a week, but if we can do that a few times, that can really impact um, our mood. And then sleep. Um, sleep tends to be one of the first things that falls off when we're feeling more stressed or if we're unable to, um, we're just kind of feeling crummy. We tend to you know, stay up later, or get up earlier, whatever it is. So really trying to prioritize some good, healthy sleep habits. Um, less sleep can actually imbalance our hormones as well, particularly dopamine. Um, so some ways that we can improve our sleep habits. I talked about not drinking caffeine after about one o'clock, um, making sure that we are 
not looking at screens um, about an hour before bedtime, the light in the screen, whether it's on our computer or TV or phone, can actually signal our body that, hey, it's time that we should stay awake, um, which it's not. <laughs> so it's time to kind of wind down and go to bed. Um, creating a routine. Our bodies love routines. So trying to find a time, time to go to bed, you're trying to go to the sim to bed the similar time every day and then waking up at a similar time every day. So if you're going to bed at uh, 10 p.m. during the weeknights and then you're going to bed at 4 a.m. on the weekends, it throws your body off a little bit. So trying to find a little bit more regular balance there. So with sleep, the other thing I um, always recommend too, if using your bed should really only be there for sleep and sex. So not working out of your bed, not um, eating in your bed, letting your bed be that place that you can, your body knows that it's, this is where we're going to sleep versus if you're working in your bed, if you're eating in your bed, if you're doing other things, your body's not going to associate your bed with sleep. So kind of fascinating again, how our bodies, um, love those routines and love kind of knowing what's, um, what's to come. So really trying to emphasize not only what we talked about today with our, um, with, how food can improve our mood, but also focusing on how can we get a little bit more activity out there. As we're getting into summer here in the Midwest, I know we all tend to get a little more active because we want to be outside, um, finding ways that can manage your stress. And it might look different from day to day, and that's okay. Um, but find something that works for you, really focusing on um, building relationships um, and maintaining them. And relationships are going to bring us joy and make us happy. And then um, emphasizing how we can prioritize sleep a little bit better. I even put an alarm on my phone at night that says, hey, it's time to stop what you're doing and wind down for bed because I am one of those people that all of a sudden I'll be like, oh, it is way past my bedtime. So it's that kind of trigger of, okay, time to slow down. Let's get in bed. Let's start our nighttime routine. All right. So wrapping everything all together, um, dietary interventions for different mood disorders is promising and future research is required to create that um, definitive correlation or causation. So what our takeaways are really trying to emphasize a whole food diet. So emphasizing a higher intake of vegetables, fruits, seafood, whole grain, whole grains, lean meats, nuts, and legumes. Um, trying to skip the highly processed and refined foods. Um, so um, those pro-inflammatory foods. And then recognizing that food is not the only connection to our mood. So what are some other lifestyle changes we can make that can help to improve our mood? And this is kind of a takeaway I didn't add on here, but we're not gonna be perfect. Just try your best. Um, try not to overstress on it. If And use every experience as kind of a learning experience. So if you did something and you're not feeling so great about it, think, okay, how can I, um, how can I improve on that and do it better and continue to learn and grow um, throughout the journey? All right, so there is my email. Um, if anyone has questions, I will stay on. Feel free to uh, pop them in the chat or uh, pull yourself off mute. Um, but my email is giberly at archimenity.com. If you have emailed me before at giberly at lifestart.net, I still do receive those emails. So you can send them there, um, my way as well. All right. Thank you all so much for joining. Um, as I mentioned, May is Mental Health Awareness Month. So definitely keep your eyes and ears out to learn some more good uh, tips throughout the month of ways that you can help um, with improving our mental health and continuing to have that conversation um, around why mental health is so important. Definitely, I would say one of the silver linings of COVID is I think it's brought us all, or the conversation of mental health is um, more relevant and or it's always been relevant, but it's more talked about and discussed. And so we need to continue that fight. Well, thank you all so much. Have a great uh, rest of your week.